today. So we're starting a new series today called Hashtag Winning. And over the next four weeks, we're going to cover four different topics in this series. We're going to, today, we're going to talk about faith. Next week, we're going to be talking about finances, week after forgiveness. And the last week, we're going to speak about the future. We all have questions about the future. I'm sure we do. I'm sure we have questions about these other topics too, but I'm excited about all of these next four weeks. So if you have your Bibles, our key text for today is 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. Let's turn there. The writer says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. And in my speech and my preaching were not the persuasive words of human wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit and of power. That your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Our faith should never be in in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So today we're going to talk about winning at faith. How can we win at faith? It's easier than you think. In the first ever state of theology survey conducted in the UK, adults were asked what they believed in when it came to religion and spirituality. They, asked, they were asked questions about God. The survey in, concluded that I don't know was the top answer to many questions that were asked. I don't know. Questions were asked about Jesus. The main response was I don't know. Questions were asked about sin and the Bible. The main response was I don't know. Questions were asked about salvation and other rudimentary theological concepts, and the answer was, I don't know. Contrast that with America, where nearly 90% of Americans say they believe in some kind of deity or spiritual force. 90%. In Australia, the number's a bit smaller, and I was surprised at this number that says 70% of Australians believe in some kind of deity or spiritual force. They say they are religious, More than a quarter of Australians say that they are spiritual but not religious. So 25% of the 70% say that they are spiritual but not religious. While 7 in 10 Australians claim to be spiritual, religious or both, less than 20% regularly attend church. That's staggering. Christianity and faith in general seems as naive, simplistic and incompatible with human reason. That's what the world will tell us. Christianity is simplistic it's naive. There is just no space for it in today's world. In fact, two really uh, popular, in inverted commas, atheists say this, faith is like a mental illness. Richard Dawkins says that. Faith is like a mental illness. This guy here, Sam Harris, says, we have names for people who have many beliefs for which there is no rational justification. When their beliefs are extremely common, we call them religious. Otherwise, they'd likely to be called mad, delusional, or psychotic. That's very sad, but that is the world that we live in today. That is the world that you and I walk into every week when we interact with people out there. These are very, very extreme examples of what we face, but we do face these. And so from that perspective, it's really easy for us as Christians to want to hide our faith, to want to push our faith to the back because... We really are scared of the minority having a go at us Christians. What we are seeing, though, is the deconstruction of the Christian faith. Little by little, moment by moment. But Jude 1 and 3 says, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once delivered for which was once for all delivered to the saints. We need to earnestly contend for the faith. There was another research project, and this is really sad, this research project, conducted by the Barna Institute in the United States of America that said that nominal Christians now believe that it's acceptable to have abortions, gay marriage, 
cohabitation, drunkenness, and even view pornography. Christendom in general accepts this as okay. That is sad. Because if we look more like the world, the world is not going to know how to, who, what to look for. We need to be more like the church and like God so that we are different and distinct. Abortion is murder. Full stop. Abortion is murder. Living together before marriage is a sin. The Bible talks about this. Drinking, smoking, drug taking are sins. Our body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. Infidelity is a sin. Fornication is a sin. We need to continue to believe the whole truth of God's word. So, beloved, that's why we read in Jude, I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation. I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you that you contend earnestly for the faith which was, which was once for all delivered to you by the, sin, the saints. Earnestly contend is to agonizingly struggle to win. It's a struggle. Earnestly contend. It's an agonizing struggle. But we can win it. We can win. Once delivered, the idea there is it's an idea that once and for all. Once and for all. The word of God doesn't change. You know, it's really funny that atheists won't admit this, but even they have a faith. They have a faith. Because everyone believes in something and makes assumptions about reality that can't be proven even through science. Everyone does. Everybody. Example, you're in a hospital and you're a nurse. One night the staff are discussing a patient who's on life support, debating whether or not to switch off the life support. The doctor turns and says, well, at least we know if we do turn off the life support, that person won't be suffering anymore. How does the doctor know that? How does the nurse that's potentially an atheist know this? You see, everyone has a faith, a belief in something, whether they like to admit it or not. Romans 12 and 3 says, For I say to you, for I say through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. Everyone has a measure of faith. Whether you want to admit it or not, whether you are in this church or not, God has given everybody the measure of faith. 1 Timothy 4 and 1 says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith having heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Now, that's scary. But there is a battle for you and I. There is a battle for our souls. There is a battle that's going on, and whether we like to admit it or not, we are in a fight. There is a battle for our faith. Our world wants us to be loud about our sin, but quiet about our faith. You know, I like to, I like to see, you know, if we're not careful, the world can can actually creep into the church if we're not careful. Now, today, it's quite bright out there. If we were to black out the windows and have the lights on and switch, turn the lights off and walk out there, it would take a while for our eyes to adjust to the change in light. But if we were to gradually turn the lights off, little by little, we walked out there, we would, there would be no actual difference in what we see in here and what we see out there because our eyes would adjust to the light. And this is, how, this is what we need to be careful of when it comes to the church. The devil will want to, little by little, wear our faith down, get us to compromise, get us to move away and get closer to those guardrails where if we're not careful, we'll fall right over, little by little, step by step. We need to take what we believe seriously. The Bible says in Ephesians 4, 4 to 6, that there is one body and one spirit, just as you are called in one hope of your calling. Verse 5, one Lord... One faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. There is one faith and Jesus is on our side. He is wanting us to win at faith. He is wanting us to see us on that day where he can say to you and me, well done, good and faithful servant. It's so much, so much, this is how much he cares. This is what he said about Peter. Peter, I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. We need to be careful about how we handle faith. There are people that have been 
churched, we'll call that, we'll use that terminology, that have been to church, that have this perspective of faith still. Something goes wrong, they don't push away God but for the most. They have this perspective of faith. And, and we need to be careful as Christians that we don't develop more of a faith perspective than a faith posture. A perspective is different to a posture. Where we are there in theory, but not in practice. We need to be there in practice when it comes to our faith. Our faith and our real life cannot be two separate things. It cannot be. It cannot be two separate things. We need to be... Double-minded man is unstable in all their ways. And our faith and real life need to be the same. 1 Corinthians 2 to 5 says that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. We have power available to us, the power of God. But is our faith in par with what we read in the Bible? That's the question I want you to ponder today. Is your faith in par with what we read in the Bible? Let's have a look at this story here, Luke 7, 1 to 10. Now, when he concluded all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. And there was a certain centurion servant who was dear to him, was sick and ready to die. So when he heard about Jesus, he sent the elders of the Jews to him, pleading with him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they begged him earnestly, saying that the one whom he should do this was deserving. For he loves our nation and has built a synagogue. Then Jesus went with them. When he was already not afar off from the house of Centurion, sent friends to him, saying, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy that you should enter my roof. Therefore, I did not even think myself worthy to come to you, but say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man placed under authority, having soldiers under me, and I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled and said at him, and turned around, he marveled at him, sorry, and turned around and said to the crowd that followed him, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And those who were sent returning to the house found the servant well, who had been sick. This centurion had great faith in Jesus Christ. He knew Jesus had the power and the authority. We too should have this great faith in Jesus Christ because he does have all the power and the authority. When we lack faith, we are telling the Lord that we don't trust him when we lack faith. It's literally the created telling the creator that we don't trust him. That's a really hard thing and doesn't make sense to me. Why would we ever tell our God that we don't have a confidence in his ability? So what are some things that we trust without questioning? S silly as it is, we turn on a light switch, we expect the lights to turn on. That's faith. We put our key in the ignition. If you have one of those cars and you turn it and you expect the ignition to turn over and your car starts, that's faith. We get on a train or a bus or a tram or an airplane and expect to get to our destination. That's faith. That's faith. We go to, the, go to the shops and speak to the salesman and expect what they're trying to sell you is actually what they've described it to be. It's faith. We trust all of these things which can and will let us down. How much more should we trust and have faith in our Creator and Savior? How much more? Hebrews 1, sorry, Hebrews 11, 1 to 6 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders have retained a good report. By faith we understand that the world were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. By faith Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it, he being dead, still speaks. Verse 5, by faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he, had taken, before he was taken, he had the testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him, to please God. 
For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Faith is the eye of the Spirit. It's what we believe on the inside. It's like turning on that light switch and expecting something to happen. When we have faith, where we do not see the electricity, we can't see, we can't see the electricity flowing through the wires and, you know, it would be nice to see that. It also might be scary. Faith is like that. We need something. We have faith that God is going to provide. We have a need. We say, well, God, I know you're going to provide it, but you need, I, I don't know how you're going to do it. You're going to do it. You know, I don't understand how cars work, but, but you press the button or turn the key and, and everything, it comes to life. I don't get that. And that is with our lives and faith. We don't understand how, what God's going to do, how he's going to do, but we know he's going to do it if we trust him. Romans, 9, Romans 10, 9 to 10 says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. This takes faith. This takes faith. The world out there will tell you to stop believing in some fairy tale. There's no such thing as God. There is no thing. It's, it's just a fairy tale and you need to stop believing it. But we don't see him. We don't. And that's what the scripture says, that with a heart we need to believe. With the heart we need to believe. That's why we need to have faith. Charles Spurgeon said, faith and obedience are bound up in the same bundle. He that obeys God, trusts God. And he that trusts God, obeys God. So Hebrews 11 and 1, you thought I'd miss these on your handout. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Substance is a confirmation or a full confidence in or an assurance. There's three spots there. And the evidence is belief in reality or proof proof so how can we prove god how can we prove god let's think this through how how do we prove it if it's the evidence of things not seen you know how do we prove god who's ever been sick who's ever been healed by god prove god there's proof right there that god is our healer we can have faith that he will heal us who's ever been bound in an addiction has, who has ever been rescued from an addiction? Proof. Proof that God can break the chains of addiction. God is able. God is able. We need to trust him and have faith. That's why I like this, that faith and obedience, they, they, they go hand in hand, faith and obedience. That's why I like this saying by Charles Spurgeon. Are bound up in the same bundle. He that obeys God, trusts God. And he that trusts God, obeys God. God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Faith is not believing God can, it's knowing that he will. Faith is not a way out, it's a way through. If we think faith is a way out, that's when we find people that expect God to deliver them instantaneously and it doesn't happen and they walk away. Faith is not a way out, but it's a way through whatever our situations and circumstances are. Mark 6, 12 and 13, so when they went out and preached that people should repent and they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. Faith gets to a point where there needs to be a demonstration. If you have faith, there needs to be proof of that faith. So here we see that the apostles went out, the disciples went out, and they preached the word, and there was a demonstration of faith through the power of the word of God. And that's why Jesus says, Assuredly, I say to you in Matthew 21, 21, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what is, was done to the fig tree. Remember, he curses this fig tree. Y'all love figs. They taste delicious. You know, but Jesus comes and it's not bearing fruit and he curses it. And then the disciples come the next day and it's shriveled up and it's dead. And so he's saying to them, he's saying to them, did I not flick the slides? 
apologies, saying to them, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Assuredly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only see what was done to the fig tree, which he cursed, and it died, it shriveled up, but also say to the mountains, be removed and cast into the sea, and it will be done. Who's ever seen that happen? Who's ever seen a mountain being thrown into the sea when you've said, move, mountain, you've got to move? I haven't. But what I have seen, it was in January of this year, general conference, we had to cancel service because of the smoke. The smoke was terrible. Those that were there will understand what I'm talking about. We got to the point where service had to be cancelled because there was so much smoke in the venue that you couldn't actually tell the difference between the outside and the inside. I wish I had photos of it, but I don't. Um, you were driving to conference that day. We hadn't found out that the service had been cancelled. And we were driving over, if you know Canberra, where conference is held every year, you drive over Lake Burley Griffin, which if you're in Canberra and you don't drive over the lake, you're going the wrong way. Um, so you drive over the lake. We couldn't see the water off the side of the gar on the other side of the guardrail. You couldn't see the water 10, 15 metres in front of you at the lake. It was terrible. So we cancelled service that day. Um, thankfully, we were still able to have Bible school graduation, Sister Rita. It was very smoky that day. But we came out for an hour, had Bible school graduation. And then, you know, we decided, the, the, the church as a whole decided it was time to pray. We woke up the next day and it was almost crystal clear. You know, that's not moving a mountain, but that could be just as close as saying the mountain to be moved. You know, you could almost, you could almost see a kilometer ahead of you the next day. We've got to have faith that says, yes, this, this situation I'm in might feel like a mountain, but in Jesus' name, I have the faith that it will move. It will change. My situation, my circumstance will change because I have the faith. He's not talking, you know, and potentially he could be talking about actually telling the mountain to get out of the way, but he's saying that we need to have the faith that moves mountains. I want to make this statement. If Christianity is false, it cannot be saved by theology. But if Christianity is true, it cannot be destroyed by science. Our faith must not be fragile. In the Bible, it talks about two men who followed Jesus. They were blind. They followed Jesus crying out, Son of David, have mercy on us. As Jesus enters the house, this is in Matthew 9. We won't turn there for time. But as Jesus enters the house and these blind men come in too, Jesus turns to them and says, do you believe I am able to do this? Do you believe? Do you believe? And they say, yes, Lord. This is faith. This is faith. Two blind men, no future, no hope, come to Jesus. And Jesus says, do you believe I am able to heal you? And they say, yes, Lord. Matthew 9 and 29 says, and he touched their eyes saying, according to your faith, let it be. According to your faith, let it be. So how does faith work? How does faith work? Firstly, faith must be a constant attitude or lifestyle, not just a life preserver. You know life preservers, life jackets, you wear them when you're going swimming. No, you don't. You wear them when you're going. For example, when I used to go to school camps, we'd go jet skiing, um, water skiing. They'd make you wear a life jacket. So if you fell off the jet ski, if you fell off the water ski, you wouldn't sink. You would be able to float. You know, if you, I don't know if anyone's ever tried to chase a jet ski once you've fallen off of it. It's not much fun. They just keep going and you don't. You've got to be a good swimmer. But this is, what, this, is, this is what we're saying here. Our faith cannot just be like that life jacket that we put on when we need it. You know, we need it today. We'll put the life jacket on. Faith needs to be a constant attitude or a lifestyle. The Bible says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith needs to be a lifestyle. Faith must be unashamedly vocalized. You can't hide your faith. You can't hide it. The world would want us to hide it, but it needs to be unashamedly vocalized. Romans 10, 8 to 10 says, But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That's the word of faith. That if you confess with your mouth, the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. We cannot stay quiet when it comes to the matters of faith. Faith must be accompanied by action. 
James 2, 17 to 20 says, that also, That's also faith by itself. If it does not have works, it's dead. But some will say, have your, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe there is one God? You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Faith must be accompanied by action. That's why when people come to the new birth, then they, they, they believe. And then once they believe, there's, there's a requirement to obey the word of God. Faith requires action. Faith must disregard obstacles. We must disregard obstacles. Obstacles can, will come our way. But we need to get over those obstacles, look past those obstacles. Don't let the obstacles stop us or slow us down. Romans 4, 19 to 21 says, And not being dead, or not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead, since he was about 100 years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. This is Abraham and his wife Sarah, who desperately wanted children. And God made promises. And the Bible says that he did not unwaver, in his fa- but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. If God has made you a promise, and all you can see are walls and obstacles, things that are in your way, we need to look past that. Abraham was 100. His wife was younger than him, about 90. That looks, that, that's impossible. When you think, if you understand the birthing process, that is un- impossible. But if we have faith, God will do that which he said he will do. Faith will not operate effectively where there is doubt present. Mark eleven twenty three to 24 says, For assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart but believes all those things, he says, will be done. He will have whatever he, whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever you ask when you pray, believe that you will receive them and you will have them. So you can say to the mountain, be removed into the sea, but you need to have faith and not doubt. And it will happen. The Bible never invites us to win at spirituality, but we are called to win at faith. Faith. This one says in part, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith? on the earth prayer is the only pathway to discover who god created us to be everything else is just a guessing game we need to pray we need to talk to god builds up our faith it's the only pathway to discovering more of god that's what corky calhoun said so believe it or not there are some degrees of faith in the bible little faith the Bible says we need to have faith like a grain of mustard seed. Yes, I say that. That is true. But a mustard seed does grow into a big tree at some point if you plant it. So we can have little faith phrased by the why are you so fearful question. It's a small. The disciples in the storm. Matthew eight twenty six. Jesus says to them, why are you so fearful or you of little faith? And Jesus arose, arises and calms the wind. Peter walking on the water, immediately Jesus stretches out his hand and catches him and says, Are you of little faith? Why did you doubt? That was Matthew 14, 31. Then we have the Sermon on the Mount. Now if God so clothed the grass of the field, Matthew 6 and 30, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not clothe, much more clothe you, O you of little faith? We can have little faith. We can have little faith, but we are called to have more than just little faith. We can just have faith. We can just have faith. Thy faith has made thee whole, where there needs to be someone seeks for an immediate sign or a feeling to confirm. The woman with the issue of blood, but Jesus turned around and when he saw her said, Be of good cheer, daughter, your faith has made you well. And that woman was made well from that hour that's faith nothing wrong with that that's faith blind Bartimaeus then Jesus said to him go your way your faith has made you well and immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road that's faith nothing wrong with that 
but we can have great faith. It's, it's available to us. If you want it, you can have great faith. Great faith is the go thy way mentality. Go thy way mentality. We already read the story, but I just want to summarize it in this. Matthew 8, 10 to 13. This is a centurion with the sick servant. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed, Surely I say unto you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And I say to you that many will come from east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus says to the centurion, go your way as you have believed, so let it be done for you. And his servant was healed that same hour. That's obedience right there. Jesus says, go your way to the centurion. And the servant was healed that same hour. This is the great faith that God wants us to have. That keep on walking when we actually don't see the result. Keep on going when, we have, when he's given us the problem and promise and it's not happening tomorrow or the next day. But we keep on walking. We keep on walking in him till we actually get the promise. This is the great faith that we can have. God has made us promises. You might be waiting a month, a year, or a decade, but he's made you a promise. As we go our way, that promise will be fulfilled. So we have the centurion servant there. We also have the woman with the demon-possessed daughter as another example. Matthew 15, 28, And Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. This is the great faith where we just go at the sound of his word we go and things happen. Doubt is faith in the devil. Full stop. We can have no faith, some faith, or great faith. Skeptics will say, God cannot fix the world he has made now, so why believe in him? Skeptics will say that. Karl Marx claimed that religion was the opium of the people. It was just a shot in the arm, a drug, just to get you a bit of a high. But it's more than that. We know that it's more than that. In fact, isn't religion not just irrelevant but dangerous to our progressive society, they'll say? We must live out our faith. We must live out our faith. Last scripture this morning, and this is a, I like this scripture. Whom having not seen, you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. Receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. That's what we're all looking for. That day where he says, well done, good and faithful servant. And we need to have faith, hold on to faith, have great faith so that we can hear that one day. As the world gets more and more dark and twisted, we need to stand more and more on the sure foundation of faith and Jesus Christ. Will it get easier to live for him? No, it will not. It will not. So... Please get that out of your mind now. It will not get easier to live for him, but you can live for him. You've just got to have faith. You've just got to have faith, knowing that one day we will receive the end of our faith, the ultimate salvation of our souls, where we see Jesus face to face. Let's stand this morning. We'll have a quick break.